Okay, so then we can start. Hi everyone, um, and thank you for joining for our science workshop today. I am Yelena, and I will just talk now really briefly to introduce you kind of what, what we will uh, be ta talking about, but then I will stop talking. <laughs> and um, so I kind of always um, wanted to, well, this doesn't really work. Okay, it works. Um, so when I was, um, like started volunteering in many conservation agencies. I was always interested in, of course, the main goal of this agency that is conservation, but I was always really, really interested in science. And I have never felt that these two things are going together very well in at least in the places where I've worked because there was always some mistrust between the conservation and basic science and researchers and conservationists and I, I didn't feel, I didn't understand why, because essentially they were all collecting the same data to in, at least in the field that I was working in. And now finally I have this chance to actually do these both things together. And then during my PhD, I work with these interesting birds. They are really threatened by climate change. And for example, of these two bird of these birdies here, there's only 25 pairs left um, of this bird. And Basically, the only way we can actually do something about this is to use basic science or fundamental science. And that can go together. And we are really trying to, to use this um, observations and results to conserve these birds. And that is also somehow what citizen science is collecting, this fundamental data. And it's really important. And it is important in engaging people with the science and contributing to the science. Um, there's today so many apps in which you can collect the data and contribute to um, data, uh, to big databases like EpiCollect, we are going to use iNaturalist, there's eBird, um, iRecord, and so on. And the very important thing is that there's a lot of people of many backgrounds involved when we are talking about citizen science, which is good because it kind of contributes to this multidisciplinarity and the different ways of thinking about different questions and also um, citizen science educates and informs people directly about environmental issues so it's kind of a hands-on approach and about biodiversity and it can fill important data gaps across both time and space and this data can also be multi-purpose so for example we have this globe at night project which is a um project that is aimed of measuring the light pollution and then it's used in ast uh, for astronomy. But um, for example, biologists can also use that data to assess the impact of uh, light pollution to uh, animal behavior, right? And so we, through new technologies, we can actually connect with each other and gather all these massive amounts of data without actually having to go to the sites and without having to fly scientists to, across the world in order to collect some data. And it's very cost effective. It can offer long term monitoring. And in my opinion, a lot of non professionals have these like superhuman ID skills uh, of identifying different species. And that's really, uh, there's a lot of positives in citizen science, but there is also some little problems that um, might occur from all of this massive amount of data. That is that it has less detail because compared to the scientifically collected data, um, we can have, that has less data, data but we, all, we kind of have more detail about it. And then it's always this thing of, yeah, well, do we have, can we actually uh, compare uh, these data are they reproducible um, and so on. So can there be also replica replicable? And it's I think these problems are not actually, this is not so problematic. And if we know where to look and how to deal with these problems, we can we we can solve them and we can use the citizen science data really good. And um, during this workshop, that's another thing, we will have two kind of Topics. First, uh, we will talk about how to bridge citizen science data and combine it with scientific data. We will hear a case study from Enya and Dr. Claudia, and um, it, their pro we will hear their project design and how will they incorporate the BioBlitz in actually their, their project. And then in the second part, we will hear from Jazz and she will tell us how to communicate uh, the BioBlitz results and 
I mean, you can use this for any results, right? For with the through the infographic and tell us about all the possibilities and possible caveats and what things that we have to pay attention to during communicating our results. And so, yeah, now it's time for me to stop talking and I can, uh, I will invite Enya and Claudia if she's there. I don't know who's gonna present, um, <laughs> okay, to, uh, to start with their presentation. Yeah. And of course, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask me, but I didn't really say anything. Yeah. Thank you, Yelena, and welcome, everyone. Uh, Dr. Claudia is having some uh, problems with her um, Wi-Fi, so she will join us later, if it's possible. Um, okay, let me, do you see my screen? Do you see the full screen or the present screen? The present, so like the presentation? like the, the format of the presentation is it uh so you we are not it's not like a slideshow it's just uh, when you open powerpoint okay let's see again now it's it uh, okay mm, we're still like if yeah i mean do you want it to be like a slideshow we, we are seeing just uh yeah now it's good yeah now it's good <laughs> Perfect. So I'm going to present about a proposal of how to merge uh, the citizen science data and research data from our local rivers. The work uh, that we are going to conduct is uh, with me, India Rosely. I'm a PhD fellow at, at IHE, Institution of Water Education in Delft. Uh, Netherlands, and with Dr. Claudia from the University of Guadalajara here in Jalisco, Mexico. So what we are trying to do is that we we usually see this bridge between uh, the citizen science source data information and the information that has been collected, and it is collected by uh, scientific research. So the way we want to combine it and try to help each other with the gaps from each other is, is to combine it. So this proposal of citizen science data analysis is cross war of data, merging the citizen science source and the scientific information in the river assessment into a river assessment. I'll make myself more clear in the next slides. So with this, uh, we had the, our principal questions that how we can assess the ecological health of the river with all of this effort going out, seeing the river, because when we go out with the river, we can easily say which river could be more conserved than other, just to looking at if, if there's uh, some trees in one transect of the river and in other river is no tree and no water. So we kind of, as, as a humans and as, as a citizens can identify those differences. So with this and with the data, we are trying to combine it in, in order to define those assets to ecological health river. Then we have to identify what methodologies can bridge together this uh, data and how we can establish the relationship if there's a relationship. So these are kind of our main, say, uh, main question in order to, to, to combine those. So our principal goal, as I mentioned, is to combine the data that has been taken by the citizens here in our, our local rivers and combine it with previous uh, research and doing a, an a analysis, a statistical analysis with those data through correlation, uh, regression analysis in order to identify certain patterns and certain um certain indicators from the citizens that could assess the river health, the river condition, how the river is. So with this, we have uh, three hypotheses. The first one is that there will be a correlation, a positive correlation with between the good condition of the river. I'll explain more about the, how we identify the good condition or the bad condition. And this will be linked to a higher, um, a higher 
metric of diversity index from the citizens' data and less number of impact types in the rib. Our second hypothesis is to, through the positive correlation, we will identify patterns between the citizen science data that will help us to know if the river is in a good situation or in a bad situation. And our third hypothesis, hypothesis is that through, with the citizen's data we could, and the correlation and regression, we will identify um, icon indicators or icon species or impacts that can identify those river health conditions. So, so about the background here is um, that in the region where we are, sorry, I don't know if it's, okay. Our study area is here in Mexico in a state of Jalisco. And here we have a micro basin, which is from outland region. We have been uh, collecting data from citizen science and collecting data from uh, riparian quality index and water quality index with uh, three streams, El Cangrejo, El Cuajinque, and Aguacapan. So those trees has certain uh, transects. The river transects, transects are around 100 and 250 meters uh, to determine its, its health condition. So a little bit about the timeline of between the research uh, effort and the citizen science, we started to, to collect water quality data around 2008. 19 and riparian vegetation and impact monitoring through the riparian quality index in 2021 and now we are uh, we are continuing collecting citizen science uh, with citizen science from 2021 to 2023 and what we are trying to do is try to combine those data in order to um, to keep in the next step I'll talk a little bit about the report on quality index. Uh, this is the main work between uh, Dr. Claudia and I and her master students. She's been using and we've been using in the in in the in the researchers the report on quality index. Here is uh, the reference, and it is based on the continuity of vegetation in the river, uh, the dimensions that the riparian vegetation has, the composition, how the regeneration is, and other things that will lead us to a final uh, indicator of health of, of the river. So this will be the base of to identify how the river is, if it's good, if it's bad. Uh, and with this, we'll, we are also identifying the impacts in those rivers. Uh, we've been uh, finding some urban, urban war growth, some pollution, garbage. It's these impacts are impacts that almost in all rivers you've been uh, observing. So with this, we are trying to identify and then we create this existing data with water quality. We have those um, databases, for example, uh, oxygen parameters from the region and the streams and the presence of coliform bacteria, which uh, kind of lead us to know where is the good or bad condition transects in the river basin. With that, uh, it's been created this map within the region so uh, the points and the colors will lead us to know how the river is. So as, as you see here in the blue color, we have an excellent condition based on the riparian quality index and the water quality index. And we, all, we already identified those transects. And the idea is to combine those transects with the transects that the citizens are going out and observing how the, the river is. So with the, the citizens, we have been working with two um, with two applications. One is EpiCollect. EpiCollect is uh, an application where you can uh, structure your questions and what data you want to, to collect from the citizens' uh, effort. So these 
had been possible through the cooperation between collectives and universities. As just to mention, the, collect the collective Vigilando Los Rios y Arroyos and Amigos del Cuajinque uh, worked together in order to create this, this map from, this map is based on impact data. If it's deforestation, if it's garbage pollution through the, those transects in, in the basin. Then, as, as you know, with the Home River Bioblitz, have been we have been promoting the iNaturalist app, collecting observation of biodiversity. So we have those uh, that data too. So with this uh, background and with existing data of, of, of identifying the transit of the basin with the repairing quality in, and the water quality, we're trying to combine the citizen science uh, data contribution from impact and from uh, biodiversity. And with this, uh, we are proposing this, this, this workflow, this framework, that is to first analyze scientific data. We already have uh, the, the, the results from uh, the Repair and Quality Index and the Water Quality Index and then analyze the citizen science data, for example, from, from biodiversity to iNaturalist and impacts from EpiCollect. So the, as I mentioned, this, this, um, this data information have been collected in the same data collection area with around 100 to 250 meters transect of the river. And we already know which is a good in a good condition and which is in a bad condition. And then uh, in order to, uh, to analyze each uh, database, uh, we are trying to identify the parameters. And then we are proposing to use the alpha biodiversity index for each biological group from the data of iNaturalist, co uh, collective based citizens, and make a list of impacts uh, values. The values could be determined by the amount of pressure that the impact can do in the river based on expert uh, proposed. This is the part of data analysis and the first data analysis, but this data analysis will be individually from each data source. Then we have, um, we'll have the correlation analysis, which we are trying to, to, to identify and to explore which data it's correlated with the, uh, uh, the existing data of our Korean water quality index. And finally, we are proposing to use a predictive model as with regression analysis in order to identify patterns from the citizen science data, biodiversity and impact to, uh, to see if there's a, a range of, of um, results that can be linked to a good situation or a bad situation. So with this mention, I'll go with our expected results with this. First is, we are so we are uh, expecting that the correlation will be uh, the first hypothesis will be accepted. So with um, with sorry with good condition we will have more diversity and less impact. In, and in bad condition we will have less biodiversity and more impacts. That's our hypothesis. Secondly, uh, we. We'll, we are expecting to create this predictive model based on the correlation and regression analysis in order that when we collect this data, the biodiversity and impact, we can connect or kind of predict a general approximation of the condition. So we don't have to use uh, this, um, the repair and quality index or so. If, if we have this data, we can predict it and approach it. So we can reduce time and effort in some way with the help with citizen science and this previous analysis. Um, finally, uh, we, with that data, we are trying to identify those regional icon indicators. And uh, in, in the end, the biggest result proposed is to develop a river condition pre-assessment with the citizen science. So uh, just ending um, and linking with with jazz uh, with the jazz presentation. This is kind of our um, um, our inspiration. This uh, infographic proposal from some uh, per, um, integrate in 
integrants from Home River BioBlitz who create this map. And what we are uh, inspiring for is to create a map with the biodiversity and impacts in the uh, basin region. And with that mention, I have the this, this presentation. I could share it with you if you want. If you have more information or more questions, I'll be here. And in this uh, presentation, I have all the reference if you like to look at it after. Thank you so much. Nice. Does anybody have any questions for Enya? We can spare some minutes for that. Yes, I have I have some questions. <laughs> uh, good presentation, Enya. Uh, I am wondering which uh, biological groups are you working to include in the analysis of the uh, alpha diversity? And how long is there for that the citizens, I, I mean, like, the people are taking the data like I, I I don't know like you are monitoring based on time or just uh, I don't know how is your uh, methodology to do that to include in your data okay could, could we, I, I stick with the second question could you repeat the one the, the first question uh, which biological groups you you are collecting the data like all the groups like Birds. Uh, I don't know which one are you working with. Okay, with uh, with iNaturalist event, with Home River Biologist event, uh, we are trying to invite experts with the citizens, and we have four experts. Uh, one is from uh, riparian vegetation, so that will be one group, and the other one is microinvertebrates. Um, this is kind of an experimental phase because they are so tiny. So we are trying to, to figure out that, that. And the other one is birds. So the, uh, the, he is our uh, third expert uh, with birds. And uh, those are the most uh, observable um, yeah, biological creatures with the citizens and that's uh, and also we have uh working together with the experts so that's that that's why we're choosing those those biological groups and in the second question we are uh trying to stick with the bioblitz uh um protocol the bioblitz bioblitz protocol uh, mentioned to have a certain uh area in a certain time we are so we are trying to use just this homebrewer bioblitz and combine it with other kind of homebrewer bioblitz, but in another uh, uh, station of the year. We are doing this in March and September as well. So with the bioblitz, uh, I mean one day in a specific hour in a specific area. The specific area is based on the good and bad condition uh, mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Elena. Okay, is there any more questions, urgent questions for Enya, or can we go to Jasmine's presentation? I don't see currently people, but you can write questions in the chat. And thank you, Enya, this was a really nice presentation. So then we can go to Jasmine. now. Hello, hi everyone. And so yeah, I'm going to talk about how we um, communicate all the things that Enya was just talking about. And I'm particularly going to focus on the use of an infographic. Um, I'll just share my screen. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, first of all, um, We'll just talk about what what is an infographic. Um, so an infographic is a visual representation of information or data, um, and that kind of that data element is quite important. It's usually um, it's a way of getting complex concepts or data across quickly and clearly, so you can really grab the audience's attention of the story that you're trying to tell. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about in this next section might cross over with the storytelling workshop if anyone attended that earlier this week and um, hopefully it'll be kind of new ideas about how we actually tell those stories visually. So why should we use an infographic? 
Um, so I'm going to show you some infographics to convince you why you should use an infographic. Um, this was a template that I've kind of added bits in to make it a little bit more relevant to the Home River BioBlitz. Um, so there's five key reasons here. One of them is to increase engagement. So infographics are usually more engaging than just pure text. Um, and they can grab our attention very quickly and, and draw the eye to the most important features of your story that you want to get across. They help us uh, convey sim simple, sorry, they help us simplify con complex information to the audience um, in a clear, concise, and fun way that's easy to understand. They help us increase awareness, so they can be used as an educational tool to increase awareness about a particular species or a habitat or an environmental issue that you are trying to um, spread awareness about. They can help us explain a process or they can help us get more people to support a call to action. So you can use them to kind of guide people through a complex environmental process. Um, and then at the end of that, you can encourage people to go away and learn more and hopefully take on um, more action to um, support your cause. And last of all, they make data more accessible. And this is the key thing, which um, the Home River BioBlitz is, again, as Enya was talking about, it's about bridging the gaps between specialist scientific data and community-driven data and how we can make all of those things more accessible to support the um, causes that we're all fighting for. If you need further convincing, there's some statistics here. So 20% of what is remembered um, is all that's remembered after reading a block of text compared to 90% of information which is transmitted to the brain as visual context. So our most of us uh, receive information better visually rather than just a block of text. So this is a good way to help things stick in the brain of your audience. 200% more images are liked on Facebook than over text. So a lot of the ways that we communicate um, science is through social media. So if we can produce something which is going to be on a popular um, social media platform, that's gonna help us in increase our engagement and the reach that our stories will, will have. Um, and that 12% average in increase in traffic after publishing an infographic is to do with um, more people going towards um, a website of, of choice. So this infographic here was um, specifically talking about attracting people to your website, for example. I won't go into the rest, um, but I just wanted to yeah, focus on particularly that 90% of information transmitted to the brain as visual um, material. So I'm going to introduce um, a way to make an infographic for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, and I just wanted to kind of go through some different levels. Um, and I wanted to say at this point, if you don't consider yourself an artistic or a creative person, please don't feel that infographics are not for you. There are so many ways now that you can draw upon templates and ready-made material um, rather than having to do it all from scratch. Um, so I just wanted to kind of break it down. So the first two here, you could use Microsoft Paint, um, which is a free um, software that comes with um, Microsoft if you have a laptop or a desktop. Um, or you could even draw with a pencil on paper and take a picture of it or scan it into um, and convert it into digital media. Um, the next two down are Canva and Pictochart. These are online softwares um, which are have free versions or a paid version. Um, and today I'm going to go through Canva um, to show you how to actually use that software. And then those final two um, are paid softwares. So um, that blue one on the left is Affinity Designer. And on the right, that's Adobe Illustrator. So if you were interested in um, going more into a high level graphic design for science communication. These are the kind of software that we use um, for things which is like high enough quality to kind of publish and, and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to show that there is something that can be available for everybody um, regardless of your prior experience. So yeah, I'm going to um, talk through 
using Canva today. Um, so last week we had, um, the River Collective had its fifth Students for Rivers Camp on the River Dart, which is um, here in Southwest England. Um, and on the first day we went out to the River Dart and we did sort of a, a very quick practice Home River Bioblitz just to introduce the participants into the project. And um, so I'm gonna use this as an example, which I very quickly put a rough infographic together with. And um, so you can see we, we didn't get many observations and we, we only had three of us with um, the app. So the level of information we collected was very minimal. Um, and I just wanna highlight that because the data that I'm using to make this infographic is not necessarily um, uh, telling a very in-depth scientific story. But I also thought it was a good example in case any of us here today, when we do uh, perform our Home River Bioblitz, you might not get as many observations as you expected or many participants as you expected. So I kind of wanted to show an example with very minimal information so that you don't feel, if you don't get a lot, then an infographic isn't for you. Like, no, no matter what you collect, you can put it into something visual to show everybody. So we had 26 observations um, that we made during, I think it was about 45 minutes we were there. Um, most of that was talking through the process. Um, and so what I did was I went into um, the iNaturalist website and I went into my our project, so the DART SRC 2023. Um, and when you click on your 26 observations, it will take you um, very helpfully to a map of where all those observations were collected. And then and if you click on the stats, which is on the right um, side there, you can then get a very helpful, quick visualization of all the data that you collected during that session. So this is kind of where we can start to think about, okay, what information have I got available and how do I want to then present that to um, target the, the audience that you're hoping to reach? So the key information that I've picked out quickly from uh, that by this was that we had 26 observations, we recorded 21 species, we've had three observers, and seven iNaturalist identifiers have um, currently confirmed the observations that we made. Um, and the interesting observations that we that I've picked out from that is we saw a lot of Himalayan balsam, which um, in the UK is an invasive species. Um, and the students also um, highlighted that they saw very few invertebrate species, which was a bit of a surprise. And we had a good discussion about why that might have been um, and drew some very quick um, hypotheses about maybe there was a relationship between how much Himalayan balsam was there and how few invertebrate species we saw. So I'm kind of using this to start creating a story and think how I might visually communicate that through an infographic. So I'm going to switch to uh, a screen recording of me doing this again very quickly in real time. Can you see that video? Great. So this is Canva and um, you find it by going to canva.com um, and it's again it's a free platform that anyone can use um, although it does have paid features. So on that home screen I went into um, the infographic option and you'll see on the left here it gives loads of different templates that you can use um, or you can create your own style um, and so what I'm uh, showing is that there's lots of different like pre-made graphics you can get make your own text if you have a brand you can kind of set up your own color schemes and um, you can draw as if with a pen and um, so it's a really friend user-friendly way to make something uh, visually appealing so I've picked a template here, which hopefully has a river already drawn for me. And what I'm gonna start doing is just exploring all of the things within that template. So on the left there, you can see it's got some pre-made um, graphics that I will later import onto this design. Um, and then, so what I've started to do is uh, edit the text so that it fits the river that I'm working on. So I was on the dart and this is where I will be doing my home river fire blitz. Um, and then I'm putting in the key information. So when that took place, so we did that last Monday on the 4th of September. Um, and then, yeah, so I'm just starting to explore the template and um, what I think I want to put in, onto that. 
The first thing that I do when I make an infographic is divide it into sections so that I can start to think how things are going to flow together. So what I'm doing here is kind of separating out uh, the templates so that I can have a uh, space for the introduction, um, a space maybe in the middle, which kind of starts to introduce the, the key elements of the, um, the survey that I want to convey to the audience. And then a section at the end will, will be where I pull this together to say, this is what I want you to do with that information, or, or maybe point people towards where they can go and find out more. So um, now I'm just going back to um, my project uh, homepage where I had all of that information that I showed just previously with the observations, number of species and the um, observers that we had on the day. Um, and this is where it's a good place to start and see what things st stuck out to you and what you think would be a good story to tell through your infographic. So here I'm just um, zooming, well, zooming out so that I can show everybody here where we were working. So we're in the United Kingdom in Southwest England, and we did our bioblitz within Dartmoor National Park um, on a section of the river Dart called Spitwick Common. Um, and all of those dots there are the participants of the Students Rivers Camp who were going out uh, with some local field guides to, to see what they could find. So what I've done is pinch that map from the iNaturalist platform. So it's ready made. I didn't have to do anything complex to get that. I just screenshot it with, um, with my laptop. And then what you can do is find these frames. Um, so you can add your image into a frame so it sits a bit more nicely into the template there. So that's kind of the first bit of information I put on is where we were working. Um, and now I'll um, start to uh, fiddle around with the template and make it look visually appealing. I tend to, when I make an infographic, just start with where my brain wants to go and what kind of looks right to me at the beginning. Lots of people have different ways of approaching this. Uh, my first draft is always a bit messy and all over the place. And then I start to refine it as I go. So this is where I then start to add in those key facts that I had before. So I'm going to start listing how many people were actually out um, measuring these species, uh, how many species we found, um, and yeah, the, the key information which will help the, the viewer understand what actually took place during this bioblitz. I think during this video, I make lots of typos, so bear with while I um, figure out what I'm trying to type on there. <laughs> But yeah, again, that this is uh, an important part when you start planning your infographic is first of all, write down the key bits that you want to have on there. So you, you don't forget to add anything on at the end. Um, and also just uh, be prepared to do lots of edits. Um, this is a very quick 20 minute um, video of, of doing it from scratch. And in reality, if you, if you make sort of a research grade template that uh, infographic that you might present at a conference, uh, you probably will have spent quite a few hours uh, fiddling around and changing it and getting lots of feedback. So don't worry if your first draft is not um, perfect and it takes a long time to, to get there. So yeah, now that I'm um, happy with what I've put as my first key bits of information, um, I'm just uh, playing around with the positioning of it. You can do... Um, these features on Canva like group objects together. So it's a bit easier to move around. Um, and then uh, once you've done that, you can sort of uh, start seeing what else is gonna fit together. So um, it's a lot easier if you just duplicate the text boxes um, and then you can edit the text and add in the key information that you wanted to add in there. So yeah, that first section, that's going to form our introduction. So where we were working and um, when it took place. Um, yeah, maybe I can speed these bits up a little bit. So yeah, I'm just uh, using that search bar in that top left corner on the element section. Um, and Canva is quite impressive with the amount of graphics it has available. It's the, one of the main reasons I use it. Um, so anything that you can 
type in there. Um, you'll see later on when I start adding some pictures of species and there's, there could be species on there that you don't, you wouldn't expect to be on a, a free software. So it's definitely worth 